Welcome to the Habit-Based Lifestyle Podcast. Use the power of discovering new habits to create success in all areas of life. Body, fitness and nutrition, being, spirituality, passion and purpose, balance, marriage, kids and relationships, business, marketing, sales, leadership and systems. Transform your life by learning how habits work. And now your host, a husband, father, entrepreneur, trainer, coach and warrior. Jesse Yule. Welcome back to the Habit Based Lifestyle Podcast. I am your host, Jesse Yule, and today we're going to be talking about the habit of sleep. I have a very special guest, Zeke Medina, who is a sleep consultant. He provides comprehensive sleep plans and support to help implement the plan uh, for sleep deprived. Uh, he helps babies, mothers, and parents uh, get sleep. So I want to welcome you on the podcast today, Zeke. Hey, thanks for having me, Jesse. I appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, what exactly is a sleep consultant? You know, I, I kind of think of it as more as a coach. Um, we basically work with individuals that, you know, have suffered from insomnia, whether they're having trouble getting to bed within 30 minutes to an hour or if they find themselves waking up in the middle of the night for no reason and they can't go to bed for 30 to 60 minutes. Obviously, this type of uh, regimen of sleep is something that affects them during the day and they don't get to have the, uh, the normal day as someone that is well, well slept, you know, as we could sure. say. Um, so what we have to do is we go through their whole history. We have a detailed questionnaire a diet and food log, an exercise log, you know, just kind of getting the nitty gritty of what exactly could be causing this. And obviously, as I go through the questionnaire, I'm looking for red flags and things that we can start working on. But ultimately, what it barrels down to is improving their sleep and then consistently, slowly uh, trying to make habit changes that not only make their health better, but also make their sleep more quality uh, as it relates to getting that deep sleep as well as good REM sleep. Sure. Because there's so much research now. I mean, uh, if you've ever read the book, Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker, I would say give it a good look because he goes over so much uh, of the benefits of sleep and also some of the risk factors when you don't sleep. So, I mean, that's definitely something that I can point out today if, uh, if you want to go over that as well. Yeah, but, for sure, man. Um, so let me ask you this. Why, why does someone need a sleep coach? Like, what are some of the benefits that, that people will see and discover by working with a coach? Simplicity. I mean, plain and simple. Um, when I was going through this, I didn't even know of the program that you can get certified to come up with this simple form of just getting them straight to the point, getting results fast. It took me just researching everything, blogs, books, articles, uh, things that, you know, you really have to search in depth for. It took me four to six weeks to fix my sleep. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, four to six months. I'm sorry. That wow. was, it was a long time. I was on medication, Ambien. Okay. That was the only way I could think. I mean, that's just kind of what, what happened. Um, I mean, I just had bad sleep ever since I was in the army and they had me work in night shift. So it was just one of those things where I knew I needed to get off of Ambien with all the research. And I have a lot of clients that are the same way. And so rather than them, you know, go four, six months trying to do it themselves, I want to simplify that for them, give them a detailed written plan and also a plan where we can go one on one with. So they don't feel lost if I just tell them, all right, we're going to talk in a week. Well, after three or four days, what happens if you have those questions? You know, it's best to get them answered. So you have that confidence moving forward so you can get those results faster. Right. Uh, so what are some of the results that you've seen working with people? Yeah. So I've worked with, man. So recently I have a client that was, um, she was pregnant. So that, that left us, uh, kind of limited to a lot of things, but, um, we were also, she was worried about, she was in her first trimester. She had issues, um, waking up at night. 
I mean, just two to three hours, she would wake up super early. And for the beginning, she was an early riser to begin with. So what we'd normally see with early risers is they go to bed early, they wake up early. That's just how their clock is. So we wanted to keep that rhythm. She was okay with it. Her husband was okay with it. And so what we've started to do is work on different types of habit changes of slowly introducing, um, you know, exercise regimens, better diet, because she would go through hours without eating. And I have had to say, tell her diet is pretty important, consistent caloric content throughout the day. You don't want those peaks and dips that are going to really make you suffer for some food. And guess what you reach for? Candy. You reach for those sweet bagels, you know? And so we had to kind of get through that. And by her just fixing like certain things with just her schedule of sleep, it allowed her to get a little bit more sleep than what she was normally used to, which allowed her to build those habits a little bit easier, you know, since, you know, if you're tired, I don't find anybody making a ton of changes easily, right? So she was able to do a lot with getting a little bit more sleep in the beginning and then building on that. So by the fourth week, I mean, I had her sleep in eight to nine. Well, I would say about seven and a half to eight hours. Now, when you are tracking people's sleep, are you tracking their overall, like just their overall sleep? Are you tracking like REM, you know, deep, awake and light sleep? Are you tracking all those or are you just tracking kind of the total hours? Yeah, um, that's interesting because, you know, we all have these Fitbits nowadays, right? And if you put them on the heart rate monitor, they'll give you um, how much deep sleep, REM sleep, and whether or not these are accurate. I mean, they have a pretty good algorithm that can estimate it. Right. But in order to really get into the nitty gritty, uh, you really have to have an EEG set up. You need eye monitors. You need heart rate monitors, blood pressure monitors to really know if whether or not you're getting those types of types of sleep. Right. Um, so me, I'm looking more of quality because um, I can easily monitor that and feel exhausted when it tells me I've had seven, seven hours and 45 minutes of sleep. Right. Um, so it's really more of how long did it take you to go to bed? Did you do the routine that we talked about right before bed? How did it feel? And if they were able to sleep fairly easily, um, and then it's always, did you sleep through the night? Because ultimately, we want uninterrupted total sleep. Okay. You know, we don't want to be waking up in the middle of the night. It's going to happen. I mean, I have, I mean, that's, that's huge. So what does that mean when we wake up in the middle of the night? What is that? You know, what is honestly, that? it means a lot. Uh, it can be anywhere from diet, first of all. So one of the main things, and I write a lot of posts about this is everybody loves to have de- uh, dessert during dinner time, right? It's always something to just top it off. But sure. what does it do? What does it do to your blood sugar? And, you know, if you have a really good dessert, you're going to get those sugars really climbing. And when they climb, what's going to be uh, is secreted by the body's pancreas, your insulin. Yeah. So depending on that peak, that pancreas is going to secrete as much insulin as it needs to to bring it down because we don't want high blood sugars, right? As that starts to come down, you're going to notice that it's going to bring you down even faster. So that hypoglycemic state typically hits around one or two o'clock in the morning. And that's where I typically have patients or clients wake up and they don't know why they're awake. They just know my body just woke me up for some reason. So, yeah. I mean, so, so basically, um, is there a window you recommend people to, not, I mean, cause really the American tradition is you eat dinner and then you have dessert. I mean, even for my three kids, what are they always asking for? You know, a half hour after dinner is like, Hey, I want dessert or 30 minutes before bed. They're like, I want dessert. And yeah. a lot of times you give in and give it to them. But the effect of that is they actually end up, waking up at, you know, 12, one o'clock. Um, but what do you recommend for people to not do like for a certain amount of time before bed as far as eating? Yeah. So when it comes to adults that have had issues, this is something that I normally find in a food log when I kind of have them write down just kind of what they eat at what times. And a lot of times it's, you know, those survival foods, which are high in carbohydrates or high in sugar. And that's the, first win that we can make, you know, Hey, let's, instead of doing this, 
let's try to make sure that your lunch and your dinner aren't as far apart because sometimes people wait six to eight hours. So not only are they starving, but they're also looking for that survival food, you know, anything that's sweet. So I try to look at that as number one, let's fix this first and give yourself about a couple of days. Now, if someone is having also a light meal at dinner time, that too is going to cause that blood sugar to kind of slowly drift or they have a really early dinner and they don't, they wait about three to four hours before they go to bed. You're also going to see a little dip in the blood sugars too. So in that case, I typically will recommend maybe an hour before they go to bed to get about a 200 calorie uh, like snack. So this snack can consist of protein, complex carbohydrates, so whole grains, maybe some peanut butter. And, and just try to take that an hour before to kind of carry you through the night so it avoids that. So when you look at middle of the night wake up, that's one case. The other cases here can be bedroom environment. You know, as uh, women are, as they get older, they're going to be going through um, menopause and other things too. And they might feel temperature changes a little bit more sensitive to, the, to their husbands. So what's cool for you may be very warm for them. And those will typically wake them up. When the body is not cooled down enough to sleep, I typically have a lot of women waking up and not knowing why. Okay. So, so you'll see a lot of issues there as well. Um, and then I've had a teenager that always kept it really warm. And she was just consistently waking up, not knowing why, but just in a sweat. And I'm, I had to explain to her, obviously, that's, that's our issue right there. Hers actually was a little bit more complex. She had a comforter directly on her skin, which was causing her to be overheated at night and waking up in a sweat. She thought it was her thyroid. And then we actually had her put a a thin sheet between her and the comforter and that solved it. (laughs) So it was, it was a pretty easy fix, but, um, yeah. Have you heard of the, uh, like, I think it's called chili pads or things like that, where they kind of keep a steady temperature. Um, have you recommended stuff like that or have you ever tested any of that or do you, do you, I'm kind of a nut into biohacking and that's big. In right. America, so I'm, I mean, if, if you live in America, you got an AC, yeah. you know, and I just say the optimal temperature for, for anybody, it's going to be around 60 to 67 degrees. Okay. Now, is that for everybody? No, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable at 70. So I just minus one degree from my comfort level. And that's good sleeping. And if it gets too warm, I just take the comforter off and I just have my sheet. Okay. So, but my wife, she loves it cold and she wants the comforter on. And that's the way she feels, co- you know, comfy and cozy. So it's really just, it's going to be based on, on, on the individual. But everybody, I mean, I would say everybody needs to have their room like a cave. I mean, it just needs to be a really dark cave. So you know? like no lights. I mean, one of the other big things, you know, I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit that um, we hear about is, is Wi-Fi, cell phone. Yeah. Is there anything that you recommend people do with that? Yeah. So, I mean, there was actually a science project by uh, some elementary school kids or maybe middle school. Did you hear about that one? No. So um, they basically took a, a plant, a certain type of plant, and they put it near a Wi-Fi signal. And they took another one, they put it away from the Wi-Fi signal. And over weeks, they noticed that the one near the Wi-Fi signal didn't grow as well. It actually looked dead. And that sparked a lot of conversation in the science community to where they want to actually now start to do more investigation on that. So most sleep plans that I have, I typically want to take away the phones at least 30 minutes before bedtime. Okay. And that goes to shutting them off if they can, uh, or just putting it across the room. Um, I really like these Fitbits because I can set an alarm on my Fitbit, turn off my phone, and the alarm's saved. So it just vibrates and it doesn't wake up my wife and I can get up and just, you know, do what I need to your, do. Is your Fitbit Bluetooth activ- activated or is that separate? Yeah. So it's Bluetooth when I connect. And then after that, it's just, all in here. Okay. So, so it's you, just a, it's just a Fitbit. I bought it on eBay for like $40. Okay. So yeah, I have a whoop band. So I'm just wondering, you know, 
Um, so yeah, like a couple things I've read about is obviously like blue screens, um, which mm -hmm. are TVs, computers, phones, um, they can affect our circadian rhythm. Um, when we, you know, they can let us know that, Hey, it may be like 10 o'clock at night, but by looking at our phones, it could actually throw that off into us thinking it might be, you know, three or four in the afternoon. Right. Um, and that can really affect our sleep. And then also Wi-Fi, um, you know, a lot of times we put our phones right by our head. And if we leave the Wi-Fi on, then, you know, we kind of have that signal. So, um, you know, I've heard, you know, for myself, I put it on usually airplane mode and shut off the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I have my whoop band on at night and that kind of tracks my sleep. But um, those are really simple fixes that I think uh, people can, can work towards. But what I really want to know, man, is what is, what are the long-term side effects of not getting, um, you know, that seven, eight hours of sleep. And then not only that, you get that consecutively to where you maybe only be getting five, six hours, you know, for, for months or for years, what are the side effects of that? So a lot. Um, so for one, without enough sleep. So they've looked at less than seven hours of sleep and what it does to the body. Um, they saw research where the sympathetic nervous system is overstimulated at that point. And, and what does that mean? So the sympathetic nervous system controls the fight or flight, you know, that we all hear about. So you're either going to fight or just run. And when you look at what happens when the fight or flight is activated, number one, you're looking at your heart rate increasing, your blood vessels constrict, so your blood vest, your your blood pressure is going up, uh, and so almost in in same constant, you have cortisol being released by your adrenal glands, and that cortisol is producing more sugar. It's also constricting those blood vessels even more. And one thing that nobody really talks about is that you also get an inflammation response from the body. And it's not a great one, but it's really there just to um, just in case your body has some kind of injury, you right. know, because if you're fighting a bear and your sympathetic nervous system's going crazy, it's going to, you know, it's going to really act in that place, you know. So if there's uh, any kind of damage, inflammatory factors are going to be launching out to that source, wherever the damage is. Okay. So, so basically, you know, kind of what you're saying is, hey, you're waking up already in this sympathetic state of fight or flight. Um, and, and most people are like, well, who cares about that? But it's like, well, you're living life in that state. So it's very hard for you to ever recover. And I don't think people really fully understand that. And so it's, it's a constant stress on our systems, you know, and right. eventually shows up in maybe your adrenals, your cortisol you know, anxiety, all these other markers. Um, and that's where I don't think people really un fully understand. It's like, well, I can sleep when I'm dead or, you know, I don't need sleep. It's overrated. And yeah. like, well, you know, Hey, you can work out all you want. If you don't recover, then you're just kind of working against the results you want. Exactly. And, th and that's one of the biggest things too, because when you have a, a release of cortisol in the body, it basically shuts off growth hormone. And when you need that growth hormone, not only to recover your muscles and your body after a workout, but your endothelium lining in your blood vessels benefits from growth hormone. It regenerates. When you can't regenerate that type of important tissue, then over time, atherosclerosis begins to build up or has a higher chance to build up. And that's why they have been able to link studies of lack of sleep to heart disease, congestive heart failure. And that's when the heart is failing, you know? So these individuals are more likely to have heart attack, stroke. And they typically see this too with uh, not only just insomnia patients, but also sleep apnea patients. So, I mean, there's a lot of research now that, that is shown a direct link to lack of sleep, less than seven hours of sleep to these types of disease states, especially diabetes. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing, man. That, uh, you know, you can get that just from lack of sleep. Um, and not only that, there's so many other 
you know, issues that we can have from that. And uh, one of the first things that you mentioned um, was, you know, nutrition. Second thing you mentioned was exercise as ways to help with sleep, um, which I thought were really powerful because a lot of times if we go to a doctor, you know, Ambien may be the first thing they recommend. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, something like Ambien that somebody may be listening to this and that's what they're taking right now as their kind of resort to sleep? Yeah, uh, that was me uh, two years ago. So it was taking Ambien for about three or four years. Like I said, I I served in the military. They had me on a a 12 to eight shift. So I, I typically just, it took me a while to get that back. Um, and I felt like it was my crutch. You know, if I didn't have it, I was, I was irate. I mean, I I would really worry. I would even get anxious about it. Um, for, for someone that's on it right now, I just want to say there, there's a lot of hope, you know, there's a tapering schedule that we can use. There's so many behavioral types therapies that we can try. There's so many proven techniques that have been proven to help not only titrate you off of this, but also to help slowly induce sleep, to teach you the habits. Because a lot of people forget when you've lost the skill to sleep, then it's a skill that we have to learn again. And that's typically why I say, I mean, this is, this is a huge thing. That's why so many psychologists are doing it. That's why people like us that are in the healthcare community are trying to get into it because we just forget that that's one oftentimes missed question when you go to your doctor's appointment, do you ever specifically have them ask you about sleep, even with your heart blood pressure, or if you've had any type of cholesterol issues, sugar issues, I always feel like that's always uh, another can of worms that most physicians just don't have time to discuss because right. they're always, you know, dependent on what they're able to do. And in a lot amount of time, because the insurance is only going to pay them so much, you know? Right. So what are the, you know, we've kind of discussed some of the reasons why people aren't getting sleep. Um, You know, one is eating too close to bedtime, maybe, uh, you know, having their cell phone too close to their bed or their blue screen. Are there any other like major things that you see? um, Yeah. Parents not getting, or people not getting sleep? A lot of times it's, um, it's bad habits that they've learned when they were little that when they were younger, they were more resistant to, they would just drink all night and go to bed and they would sleep until whenever they needed to, and they'd wake up. And so a lot of times, you know, I've had a lot of clients with nightcaps. I was like, well, what's a nightcap, you know? And they will tell me, uh, you know, just three, four fingers of, of whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it relaxes me. And so you kind of have to educate them on certain things. It's okay to have a nightcap. I won't tell you to stop that but I'm going to lengthen that time from when you go to bed because they need to understand that when you drink alcohol for say, it's going to stimulate a certain receptor in the brain called the GABA receptor. And then after a while, it's going to cause that GABA receptor to go back into the nerve. And now you don't have any inhibitory sensors at that point. All you have is excitatory. So you're going to have a lot of excitement going on in the brain in the middle of the night, depending on how much you drank. And that's going to be the difference between you having a really poor night of sleep and low quality sleep. So, I mean, it's simple things like when to drink certain things, when to eat certain things. And then on top of that, it's all about paving the way for certain positive habits during the day that are going to keep that rhythm and as well as the uh, sleep pressure to where it needs to be by the time it's bedtime. Uh, are you familiar with process S and process C of, of sleep? No. Okay. I mean, we could talk about that later, but it's typically what I use when I'm evaluating which um, process is potentially off and how are we going to get it back, you okay. know, into hey, a line. Go ahead. You can, you can talk about it if you want. Go ahead. Okay. So when I'm working with clients and I'm looking through the questionnaire, as well as all of their, um, all of their, their diet and food logs, there's a process called process C. This is our circadian rhythm. So, I mean, basically it's what we know it as, um, everything is on a rhythm to light and day. 
So sure. during the light, during the day, you want to be exposed to as much light as possible. So you keep those hormones running, keeping you awake, keeping you alert. And then closer to bedtime, you want to start minimizing the light and therefore inducing more of those sleep chemicals so you can slowly start to feel drowsy. Now, this is exactly in sync with a process called S, and it's just basically sleep pressure. Okay. So after 16 hours of our body being awake, we build up a chemical called adenosine. And as that chemical builds up, it's causing the sleep pressure on us, causing us to feel drowsy. And this is typically what I worry about with sleep-deprived individuals. Um, so we get a lot of moms that are, you know, that they'll post on Instagram, this is my third night with four, two hours of sleep. And I go, why are you operating your vehicle? You know, because so much sleep pressure built up. I mean, you're just going to, all it takes is one, two seconds of a micro sleep and you've just lost control of your vehicle, you know? So I'm looking at sleep pressure, finally balancing that out with a lot of older individuals. They take a lot of naps and they usually take late naps because they're so exhausted. So they would sleep around four to six o'clock and then they would be upset that they can't go to bed at 10. So we have to kind of help eliminate those naps or limit them in time frame so they don't lose as much sleep pressure. Okay. So by the time it gets to where they need to be at a sleep, their sleep pressure is enough to where it's perfectly sync with that circadian rhythm and they can go ahead and take that, that dive in sleep. So wow. I'm always looking at those two systems and finding out which one is, uh, is not in alignment and trying to fix that. And usually they're always going to be in, in, in kind of slight disarray. And that's why you always have those slight dips in energy level, like in the middle of your day where you can tell yourself like, this would be a perfect time to have a nap, sure. you know, or meditation and, or yeah. And I just say, if you can't take a nap at work, go for a walk outside you know, take about 20 minutes because the best light that you can give yourself is the mid afternoon sun, because it's about a hundred lux. It's good enough to kind of reset you. And yeah, anytime you're out in the nature, I mean, yeah, close your eyes, do some meditation. I think that's perfect. Awesome, man. Those are, that's amazing. So what are, so what are the different types of sleep and what do each one of them mean? Yes. So our bodies go through a cycle and goes through pretty much five sleep cycles. You got stage one and stage two, which are considered light stage sleep. Um, These are probably the ones where when you're in this stage sleep, if something changes in your environment, whether the the temperature changes, whether you hear a noise or whether somebody touches you in that stage, you're most likely to wake up and feel like you've never been asleep at all. Right. Right. Now, Then you go into the deeper stages, stages three and four. This is typically when your body is doing a lot of recovery work. And you typically will spend longer, longer durations of stage three and four in the first four hours of your sleep. So that's why getting to sleep fast and efficiently is more important. So you can get right into that deep stage sleep because your first cycle, you're going to spend most a good while in that first cycle in deep stage. So first cycle, you, you end up doing more of your deep sleep. And then the second slide cycle, you do more of your REM. Well, you'll be doing less and less of deep and more and more of REM. So by the time it flips over to the latter half of the four hours, you won't be getting as much deep stage sleep as you did in the beginning of your slumber. Whereas REM sleep, you'll be getting more and more and more of your REM sleep. So, As you're familiar with deep stage, I mean, that's our recovery sleep. So your growth hormones being released, you know, you're also getting a lot of, um, it just, uh, in 2013, they published a study that showed, uh, that there was a lot of toxins and proteins that were being eliminated out of our brain. And these toxins and proteins were related to neurodegenerative disease, like Alzheimer's. And so when you say something like that, um, they saw that. When you look at an EEG, you know, one of those brain activity scans of yeah. deep sleep, you'll see a, a bunch of big peaks and troughs. And what's happening is the brain is getting really excited and then it's calming down. It's getting really excited. And what it's doing is when it calms down, the lymphatic tissue, uh, lymphatic system, I'm sorry, close to the brain 
is sucking up all, a lot of these toxins as the brain is calming down. So it's like, it's a perfect system. And that's why they, they treat that as, uh, as something that's extremely beneficial. And then as you know of REM, I mean, that's, that's where all the creation is, you know? So in the deep stage, you're taking a lot of these short-term memories that are, you want to learn. So if you're a student or a doctor or someone that's really learning on a daily basis, you're taking those short-term memories you just learned and you're putting them into a long-term bank. And that's in deep stage. In REM stage, you're now taking these long-term memories and now associating with the memories that you already have. And that's why they say this is important for critical thinking, imagination, creativity. Um, so that term sleep on it. I mean, that's typically what this, you know, is going towards, you know, just go ahead. So, so a question on, you know, some of the questions people often ask me is how much REM and deep sleep do I need um, for it to be efficient compared to my overall sleep? You know, you, you can't really answer that with a Fitbit because a lot of people I'll look on their Fitbit tractors and they really um, start to get real anxious about why well, I'm not getting this much REM sleep or I said I didn't get any REM sleep and no deep sleep. And I'm like, right. they're not that accurate. So I tried never to go there. What they can do the best, really the best is if you're going to bed fairly easily and you're able to stay asleep for the most of the time, I mean, I would say at least seven and a half to eight hours of sleep, if you're able to achieve that, then you could assume that your body's doing what it needs to do. Now, you can go way in depth to get a sleep study and really get the, the fine results of that. Right. I, but have you ever been to a sleep study? No. Never, okay. Uh, I mean, it's, it's highly uncomfortable. They're working on different equipment that you can take home with you. So you're more in, a, in an environment that's a little friendly to sleep. But I mean, you have things attached to every part of your body, you know, a lot of good information that came out of that. You know, they can tell you if you have certain types of uh, nerve twitching, like, a, like restless leg syndrome. And I have a lot of uh, issues there where, you know, some people are just waking up because they're twitching, you know, basically off the bed, you know. Um, so sleep studies can be helpful there. But as it relates to your sleep, I mean, you typically want about five to seven sleep cycles if you can get them. And that basically just comes down to, you know, seven and a half to eight hours or, you know, even seven to eight hours. Um, obviously, we can get more if you can. And if you do, I mean, more power to you. I mean, that's awesome. But we all have jobs. We all have second jobs, you know. So it's, it's uh, at the very minimum, I try to just get every single client at a, at least seven to seven and a half hours. If they want more, they can definitely, we can reach for more, but it's all about when you wake up, how do you feel? Sure. Do you feel rested? Do you feel like you need that coffee right away? Or can you wait two or three hours before you get it? And if we can, you know, improve those types of morning symptoms, then we have a win for sure. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So I I've heard, well, I've heard kind of some mixed things that you need about 40% of total sleep and deep in REM. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, if there's any valid. To me, it's like if I wake up and I feel tired, chances are, you know, if I had seven to eight hours of sleep, my sleep performance wasn't as great as, you know, a lot of times we'll wake up. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm like ready to go. I feel on fire. Yeah. And, and I think those are ways that we have to just learn how to listen to our body. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes I think we rely too much on technology that we kind of stop asking ourselves, hey, what do I actually need for sleep tonight? Right. Um, and a lot of times our body kind of tells us by yawning, you know, at 9, 930, or yeah. we start kind of getting tired and you know, for a lot of people nowadays, they just pick up their phone when they start getting tired and it's like a jolt of caffeine <laughs> and it's like, oh, I'm good. I can scroll for another 30 minutes before bed. So, yeah. I, it's like the easiest, like, uh, it's, it's just a, our guilty pleasure. Right. And I almost say like, you mentioned a lot of blue light and yeah. that's, that's also one thing I, I like to talk to my clients about too, because, you know, you get the blue light and that's been shown to have the most inhibition of excreting melatonin or, or creating melatonin in the, in the brain. Right. Right. 
melatonin is effective. I mean, have you ever tried taking melatonin? Half the people that take it. I don't do good with melatonin. I feel tired and groggy all the time. <laughs> so, um, but I try to tell them, um, start looking at not just blue light, but also the brightness of light that you have in your house. Because one light bulb is about 180 lux of light. And it typically takes about that much to alter your biological clock. Okay. So I would highly recommend, and I recommend this to all my clients, is buying dimmers. Um, obviously, you can get the dimmers on the lights and just kind of move them up and down. That would be uh, the fancy way. I just go to Home Depot and I buy the lamp dimmers and I put them next to uh, either my bed. So when I come in for, uh, for, for my, my nighttime, I'll keep it extremely low. I have a lamp in my bathroom where it's extremely low. And if I can't sleep, you know, within 15, 20 minutes, I'll go out to the room where there's another light dimmer where I can either read an article, read a book, something that's, you know, very mundane and boring. And that will definitely make me more drowsy. Okay. Do you wear uh, the blue blocking glasses or any of that stuff? No. <laughs> yeah, so no, I... I mean I have uh, kind of multiple pairs of those. I have the red ones, the yellow ones uh, that I typically will wear at night. Yeah. I'm working on my computer or watching TV. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do it, um, you know, just try to keep the brightness low. Keep the glasses on. They don't hurt. Um, and then I think most, mostly everybody, if you have an iPhone, they have a night shift mode now. Yeah, where you can do that. And so I just, as long as the brightness is slow and you have that, that orange tinge to it, you're blocking something. But the fact that you're still on social media, it's that dopamine release that, that really bugged me. You know, when you get a red flag or a sticker or something that says, Oh, someone's liked your photo. You're going to, you're going to want to investigate that person or, or look at them. And I, that's why I just say 30 minutes before bed or even more, if you can, um, you know, use that time for quality, use it for you, use it for your spouse. I mean, be involved, be, you know, present basically. And that's right. typically what usually in the second, third week, we start throwing in more meditation because it's, it's all about being present, you know, sure. when it, when it's all said and done. Of course. So do you have a, a recommendation on how people can improve sleep? So you talked about food, you talked about exercise, We've talked a little bit about blue screen. Is there a supplement to recommend for people? Is there, yeah, you know, is there anything specific that you might say, you know, hey, I heard, I heard this, or this is what works really well for clients. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, we're gonna we're gonna stay away from stimulants. You know, you know, coffee, any type of dietary supplements that can cause stimulation. Um, and then when it comes down to supplements, I typically get all my clients on magnesium. Okay. I'm a firm believer that the majority of America are lacking magnesium. So the, the form that I typically try to go with is magnesium glycinate. It's a chelated form that allows for fast absorption. I typically try to do about 300 milligrams at night. Uh, is that you as well? <laughs> I have it, man. So that's why I was just like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm on the right track. Okay. Okay. So with that, I mean, magnesium is a cofactor for thousands of biological, you know, processes in our body. So let's replenish that. It also has a calming effect. The only thing I would say, watch out for is if you find yourself waking up with a bowel movement, because magnesium can do that, can move your bowels a little bit quicker. You might find yourself having to take it about six to hour, six to eight hours before bedtime. So you can okay. get that out of the way. Um, but with that, calcium is also important, not just for your bones, but it's a cofactor in producing melatonin, you know, in that process of tryptophan to serotonin to melatonin. So I typically will recommend at least 600 milligrams of calcium. And once again, calcium glycinate, something that absorbs it. But if you're only at Walmart and you can only find calcium citrate at a 600 milligram, that's fine too you know, um, but then a good quality multivitamin, I don't have a preference of which one. I think a lot of the supplement companies are pretty slimy when it comes to what they say they have, unless it's been tested. So if you have a dietitian or a nutritionist that have a good multivitamin that you can take, I mean, that would obviously take care of it for me. Okay, cool.
Cool. So calcium from a supplement, not from milk. You know, I, I usually do a lot of milk myself. Um, and, and this would, like I said, it would just be something where we would try it out and see if it helps. Okay. And if they don't notice a difference, I'm going to kick it out. Especially if they say, you know, they eat a lot of broccoli, they eat a lot of vegetables with calcium, they eat, drink milk. Uh, if they're getting it that way, obviously your body's going to absorb that much better. Um, but, you know, I'm also going to be asking them, when was the last time you had a vitamin D level check? Because sometimes with colder winter months, you don't absorb as much vitamin D and that's deeply responsible for absorbing calcium. So sometimes you, we need to fix the vitamin D deficiency as well. Okay. Yeah. And if, you know, if you're in an office all day, you know, it doesn't matter right. if you live in a warm climate or not, if you're not getting out, um, into the first part of the sun of the day and getting it on your body, in your eyes or your head, then chances are you're probably going to have a lower vitamin D or you're in a colder climate. Precisely. I mean, so a lot of times where, um, and just in healthcare in general, we deal with a lot of older patients that don't go outside very often. And so we typically have to increase their vitamin D to anywhere from three to 5,000 units per day. Wow. Um, just to make sure they're able to still absorb calcium because without vitamin D, your body just takes calcium and spits it out. But a good multivitamin should have a good supplement of that and therefore giving you things like vitamin K2, as well as other cofactors that help you absorb the calcium. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, hey, uh, is there is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to cover on this like with anything with to do with sleeping? Yeah, you know, as as we we kind of, you know, kind of reiterate it time and time again, it's it's all about taking care of your body. You know, we in the sleep community, we say wogo, it's kind of like our YOLO. Uh, we only get one. Only one body. And so if you felt like you've been mistreating it for, you know, you're maybe 35, 45, you finally got on a blood pressure medicine or they've started talking to you about diet and exercise you know, look at sleep. If you don't think it's insomnia, get a sleep study because a lot of older individuals, and it doesn't now, it doesn't discriminate on age, weight, neck circumference, sleep apnea can affect anyone in which you can easily get help with a CPAP machine. Um, so go see your doctor for that. But if you've been struggling with your sleep for years, the research is already out there. I'm not making anything up. I'm just bringing it to the forefront. Um, seek help, you know, even if it's a blog article, make those small changes. I typically recommend stick with the schedule first, you know, try to get your body asleep at this time or lay down at this time, wake up at this time, stick with that. Even in the weekends, don't, don't push it. Don't try to stay out at two o'clock in the morning when you know you shouldn't, because that's really going to mess you up if you have sleep issues. And if you think it's anxiety related, you know, seek help. You know, and that's, and that's kind of what we're here for Just kind of getting your mind off of that and trying to help you bring back that, um, that mental clarity to keeping yourself in the moment. So you can just focus on that one thing and that's sleep. So listen, if you're listening to this podcast and, um, you know, as a lot of people are probably 90% of the population, you don't get that six, six hours of sleep, let alone seven to eight hours. Um, and you're looking to uh, increase the, your performance in your sleep. How do how do people come in contact with you, Zeke? Thank you for uh, so we have a company website called LiveLoveSleep.com, and this is for everybody now. So if you're struggling as an adult, you can book a free 50 minute evaluation where we go over your issues and see if this is right for you. Okay. A lot of times I'll catch one simple thing where I say, Hey, let's try this. Give me a call and see how it works. And if we need to go more in detail, we're going to set up a plan for you. Um, if you might be a parent or a <laughs> you just had a newborn and your baby is keeping you up at night, we just hired uh, three more consultants to help us out with that. And, um, and that's been a huge, uh, huge improvement where you know, we can get your baby to sleep and allow you to get back to sleep. So whether or not it's your baby or if it's you, 
uh, you can always go on livelovesleep.com, check us out and, uh, and book a sales call. Even if it's your child that you want to get fixed or if it's yourself, um, you just go underneath our consultants tab. You'll see me, Zeke Medina, or you can check out my sleep packages, adult sleep packages or 17 and up and just take a look at it and see if that's something that, uh, that fits you. And if you guys are listening to this uh, podcast, go to the show notes and I'll have the link in there for Zeke. It's called Live, Love, Laugh. Say that. Live, love, live, love, sleep. Live, love, sleep. Yeah. Dot com. It's a good one. Man. So, well, hey, I want to thank you for being on here and uh, and just giving us all this information and resources and just how much I appreciate you, man. Well, I appreciate you having me and let me spread the word, man. I really appreciate it. I'm a big fan and, uh, and keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank you again. All right. Thank you. Uh, if you guys are looking to connect further with a group of like-minded people, join myself and so many others in the Habit-Based Lifestyle Secrets group on Facebook, where I will be dropping daily habits to help you live to your full potential. If you want to be one of our next case studies and begin living this habit-based lifestyle, uh, feel free to reach out to me, jesse at habitbasedlifestyle.com or check out our website, habitbasedlifestyle.com. Until next episode, have a great day.